in the future. Amen. Thanks, Pastor John. And you know, there's a he's a great example of never give up, right? God is continuing to work, God's continuing to move. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18. Over the past couple of weeks, we've been, we've been looking at this, uh, this theme of, of God's desire for kingdom expansion. That his kingdom would grow, his kingdom would develop. Um, and it's really interesting that we're, we're looking at this because I don't know about you, but I've come to the realization, I've been watching for the past few years or several years or many years as is really the influence of the church, the reputation of the church, uh, the reputation of God's kingdom has been declining, right? The interest in people wanting to be a part of God's kingdom, a part of his church, has been declining. Um, we're, we're seeing more and more direct opposition to the things of God and the people of God. And, and as we look at this, it's really easy to, to look at it and go, wow. We're in big trouble. We got, we got problems. We got issues going on. And then on top of it, you know, you look around the world and, and you see all around us and there are so many people who are, who are just really, their lives are, are, are living in a way that, that they're just going, there's all sorts of anxiety, there's all sorts of stress, uh, people don't feel safe. And it's bringing up all of these issues all around us. So we've got racial issues, we've got political issues, we've got, we've got moral issues, we've got all the, you know, we've got political, we got everything going on just seems to be breeding, this breeding ground for stress and anxiety and unrest and, and just this whole thing of being unsafe. And a lot of people have been looking at this and going, you know, hey, what does this mean for the church? What is it? And, and there's been a lot of people, and I've heard a lot of doomsday speakers are saying, well, the church is dying out, and the church is done, and, you know, and, and it's just going to keep getting worse and worse. And, and I've seen a lot of people who've, who've gotten really anxious about that idea, and, and, and we've almost got, come to this, this attitude of, well, we've got to circle the wagons, and we've got to protect ourselves, and we've got to kind of become our own little group and, and make sure that we're okay and, and, and just kind of shield ourselves from the world around us and from all the negativity that's going on around us. Now, it's interesting because uh, I'm part of a, of a pastor's continuing growing group, and basically it's a pastor's book of the month club where we read a book and then we get together and talk about it. And, and the one we've been reading this month is, is called Reappearing Church. And it's a book written by Mark Sayers, who's a pastor in Australia, and he's been following the, the trends. In fact, the, the book right before this that he wrote was called Disappearing Church, where he addressed all the issues of the, of the decline in the church and where the church is going. Um, and, and he came in here and he's, he wrote this one next. And, and its and this subtitle is The Hope for Renewal in the Rise of Our Post-Christian Culture. Okay? And basically what his premise is is that is that what we tend to forget and what we've tended to get our eyes off of and our focus off of in the midst of the struggles, in the midst of uh, the crises, in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of all the issues that are going around us, is that all, everything that's going on is the perfect breeding ground for revival. <laughs> okay? We look at it and go, and most people look at it and go, oh, look how terrible it is. And he's going, no! <laughs> it's when things are tough, it's when things are hard, that's when revival has opportunity. That's when we have the greatest time for possibly re revival. He says, but, but instead of, a, but then he says the problem is that then we focus on revival. We focus on revival. He says, no, we don't focus on, he says we need to focus on renewal. Renewal. And some people are going, well, what's the difference? Well, well here, he, he, actually define, he actually defines this on page 33 of his book. He says, here's what renewal. It's the refreshment, release, and advancement that individuals, groups, churches, and cultures experience when they are realigned with God's presence. Or the, be, the resumption of our God-given purpose to partner with God fully, participating in his plan to flood the world 
with his presence. So renewal is about us coming together, coming back to God, getting back into connection with God, relationship with God, fully trusting in him and partnering with him in his mission. Right? Well, then if that's renewal, what's revival? He says, when renewal occurs on a large scale, bringing significant advancement, growth, and kingdom fruit to a city, people group, movement, region, or nations, revival is renewal gone viral, is what he says. And so, and so we're called to that. We're called to this renewal. We're called to life change, and, and that we are called to be ambassadors of renewal in the world around us and in the people around us. And that's what we've been doing here. We've been, we've been seeking God. How do you want to do? God, what do you want to do in our lives? What do you want to do in us as individuals? What do you want to do in us as a church? And how can we then take that and as we are going, share that with others? And in Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 18, we, we see here that the continuation of this con kingdom expansion plan that God has, how he's continued to work, how he's continued to move, to see this renewal in individuals that then becomes revival. All right? Acts chapter 11, 1 through 18. Please follow along as I read. The apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice tell me, get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. God, we pray you'd speak to us today through your word. That you teach us your truth. That God, you can show us how, how we can join you in your mission. We can join you in your ministry that we can see your kingdom grow and expand, that we would see renewal in our lives and we'd see revival throughout the land and throughout the world as you lead us and as you guide us according to your spirit. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Well, God has called us that as we are going, make Christ-like disciples, right? Who love God, love others, love themselves and serve the world. He's called us to join in, he, and he said, guess what? This isn't just for you. This is for the whole world. This is God's calling, his message. Peter tells us the will of God is that none should perish, but all should come to repentance. And so we have joined him in this mission. We've joined him in his ministry. We need to see that this is happening. But then the question becomes, well, how do I help build the kingdom and we've been looking over the last couple of weeks at, at this in Acts chapter 10 of, G, of Peter's uh, encounter with Cornelius and how God moved in there and how God worked and how God's doing this. And now as we continue on, we're going to learn some, we're going to learn some other things about how we can help build the kingdom of God, how we can join him in building the kingdom. The first thing we need to understand is that if we're going to truly join God in helping to build his kingdom, then we can expect opposition. Okay? Aren't you glad you came today? <laughs> All right? But, but we can expect opposition. Not everybody's going to be excited about what God is doing in and through our lives. 
Not everybody's going to be excited about the kingdom of God growing and expanding and becoming what, who God and what God desires for it to be. And we will have, we will run into opposition. Some of that opposition is going to come from outside the family, okay? It's going to come from outside. The things that are going on around, uh, you know, Paul tells us that, that we are in a battle, and our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's, but it's a spiritual battle in the, in the heavenly realms that, that we're encountered with. And guess what? Satan doesn't want to see God's kingdom expand. And, and so we are in a battle, and it's a spiritual battle. So we have outside opposition. There are people who have joined, there are people who are under the influence, under Satan's influence, under evil spirits' influences. And I, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying they're all demon possessed, but they're under that influence. Okay, they're following the lies of Satan, they're following the path of Satan, and they, they oppose us here on earth. They're in opposition to the kingdom of God and to the things of God and the truth of God to move forward. There is opposition out there. And, and we need to realize that. I, I don't know if you've watched the news, I don't know if you've watched media, but there's a growing trend of negativity towards the church all around us. Okay? And there's people who are trying to push that and are, and are trying to see that. There is opposition out there. We, we need to remember in that, that 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 opposition, like I said from what Paul shared with us, is a spiritual battle. Believe it or not, those people, even the ones who come directly against us, are not our enemies. They are people God loves and God cares about. They are the, they're the same people Jesus died for. To bring them in. In fact, you know, this will probably resonate with more people here than maybe a lot of other places. What if, we, what if instead of thinking of them as our opposition or even as our enemies, what if instead we viewed them as prisoners of war who have been captured by our enemies? And God has called us to bring freedom and liberation and to share his love with them. in the hope and the attempt that they can be rescued and returned home. How would that change the way we respond? How would that change the way we interact or, or we view them or we pray for them even? If instead of seeing them as our enemy, we instead saw them as our brothers and sisters who are just caught in the, and enslaved and entrapped by the real enemy. But there is a reality. We will experience opposition as the people of God from outside. There are people who come. But the other reality is that, is that we can expect opposition, and sometimes it will come from inside the family. Our brothers and sisters, the ones we love, the ones who are, who are seeking to follow the same Christ that we are seeking to follow, we can run into opposition. Peter runs into that, right? Right? He goes out, they have this great, you want to talk about revival, you know, holiness meeting there. Peter's there uh, with Cornelius, with his family, with, with friends and stuff. Holy Spirit comes, it's, it's an exciting time. He gets back and, and the next thing it, he says, uh, he says the, the brothers, uh, the, the apostles and the brothers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the Holy Spirit, okay? They, they, they'd received the word of God, <laughs> Now listen, to verse 3. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. All right? Peter's coming back. God has just moved. Can you, can you imagine how good Peter is feeling when he's coming back about this? I mean, the Holy Spirit had just poured out. In fact, if you, you read later on in Peter's testimony, he says, I didn't even get to finish my sermon. Right? He just started speaking and suddenly the Holy Spirit, he didn't even get to finish his sermon. He just, Holy Spirit took over. All right? And, and he's there and he's moving and he's just so excited about what the Holy Spirit's doing and, and how he's moving and doing all this stuff. And he gets back and the first thing he encounters, criticism. Criticism. All this is going on and, and all anybody can think about is, you went in the home of uncircumcised people. How could you? How could you? And, and, and now I know, 
today, Holy Spirit moves, we sometimes end up in things that we can expect that God's going to move us in ways we don't expect, we can, exp we can plan on that God's going to call us into things that we haven't done before. There's, as God continues to move, there's going to be some things he's going to say, hey, we need to let go of some of those things, even if they're things we've always done. Because he's saying, uh, we, he has a plan and he has a purpose. And, and there's too many people out there that need to hear about it for us to get caught up in all the, uh, what we always have or what we never have done. And instead to say, hey, God, we will be obedient to you right here, right now. What do you want? Where are you moving? How can we join in? What's going on? And, and I've been, like I said, we've been pastoring for about 28 years now, full time. And in the midst of that, I've seen so many of the things that tend to happen in the church. When the Holy Spirit moves, the Holy Spirit, and, and immediately there's, there's opposition. There's opposition. Oh, we've never done things that way before. Oh, we've always done it this way before. Can't change, can't do it, can't, you know, and, and, and I'm not surprised by it. I, I, I've done it myself, okay? Be honest about it. But the thing I've discovered in myself and in the people I've talked to and, and the things I've observed as we've gone through, what I, what I found was that, was that the arguments and the things that are going on had nothing to do with the will of God, They always had to do with personal preference or my comfort. I'm not comfortable with that. Sorry, God didn't call us to comfort. All right? And if somebody told you, hey, you follow God, you'll always be comfortable, they lied. I'm sorry. All right? God did not call us to comfort. He called us to obedience. I mean, we're, we're, we're called and we keep saying we want to become like Jesus, right? Anybody here going, yeah, I'm, I, I want to become more like Jesus. We're all on this journey. Would you explain one thing that was comfortable about the cross? Oh. I want to be like Jesus. Jesus' own testimony about himself. Son of man has no place to lay his head. People oppose me. Uh, you know, all, all this stuff. Then you go Paul. And you think about Paul and, and you think about, well, Paul, Paul definitely led a comfortable life, right? He was, he was the greatest missionary and he was really a man of God. He, his life must have been really comfortable, huh? <laughs> he talks about all the times he was beaten and imprisoned and, you know, stone left for dead, shipwrecked. He said he was, found himself naked, he found himself starry. He said, he, you want to talk about hardships and stuff like that. Yeah. We, we thought, you know, you think about the fact that most of our New Testament was written by him. <laughs> Do you realize it was all written from prison? <laughs> okay. Not comfortable. Not comfortable. And yet somehow, somehow we seem to have bought into, into this in the church. And, and I'm not pointing my fingers at anybody else because I'm right there with, with all of you, okay? Is that somehow we have built this idol of comfort in the church. That has said, you know what? It needs to be comfortable. And if it's, if it's not comfortable, it's not of God. Guess where that message came from? It wasn't the Bible. The influence of those outside. Allowing it to come inside. And making it our own. And in the midst of all of this, with, with all the different things we can say, all the different arguments we can give that the world is trying to share with us and do that, it's infiltrated the church. And we need to get back to, and this is, this is a scary thing, and I'll tell you, it is not popular even in the church today. We need to get back to, it's the word of God first. And it's the truth of God first. And if I don't understand it, it's not because God's wrong, it's because I am. Okay? If I don't agree with it, God's not the one who's wrong. It's either I don't understand it right, or I, don't, I haven't experienced it the way I'm supposed to, or something like that. But I'm going to go with what the Word of God says, whether it makes sense or not.
And I'll tell you, that's not popular. But that is where we need to be. And that's what God has called us to. And so we, we just need to understand that if we're going to say, God, we're going to follow you. God, your spirit's going to lead us. We're going to be obedient. We want to see your spirit poured out. We want to see renewal in our lives. And as our lives are renewed, that it would spread out to others, that their lives would be renewed, that we would experience revival. We've got to understand, we, there will be opposition. Just expect it. The good news is, in the midst of it, uh, Jesus himself told his disciples, you know what? Don't worry about it. I've overcome the world. We've already won, okay? It's, it's done. It's finished. It, the victory's already been declared and won. And so any, any opposition that comes has already been defeated. And we just got to keep trusting God and keep following him and keep being obedient. And he will see us through. So how can I help build the kingdom? Number one, expect opposition. But then number two is overcome opposition. Overcome opposition. Like I said, Jesus said, don't take heart. I've already overcome the world. I've already defeated. The opposition has already been defeated. It's just, it's, it's just now, you know, lip service and, and, and background noise to, to try and distract us and try to keep us off of our focus and, and what God desires for us. Well, if we're supposed to overcome the opposition, how are, how are we supposed to do it? Well, let's follow Peter's example. The first thing is, state the facts, right? Opposition comes. We start talking about the Word of God. We start talking about what God has called us to. People say, no, that's wrong. They're not supposed to do that. What are you supposed to do? State the facts. How has God worked? How has God moved? Peter comes in here. He just replays what God did and how God worked in his life. Notice he doesn't sit there and try to tell what happened with everybody else. He doesn't try to say God spoke to everybody. All he says is, this is my experience. This is what God said to me. This is how God worked in my life and through my life. This is where I was going with. And that's what we have. Pastor John came up here today and said, hey, why do, why do I believe people can be set free? 25 years ago, God set me free. Right? And as we go in the world and as we're going out there and as we're saying, hey, how do I know you can have hope? How do I know you can have peace? How do I know you don't have to be anxious and stressed and allow everything in the world to just overcome you and overwhelm you and make your life, just mess your life all up? How do I know that? Well, because God's been doing it for me. He's been doing it for me. But that means you have to have let him do it for you so that you can then give that testimony, right? You sit there and say, hey, you know what? All you... That's all God calls us to do. As we're going, just share what we know. What do we know? What I've personally experienced. That's what we can share. That's all God calls us to share. Too often I hear people going, well, I don't know the Bible well enough. Well, I don't know these, these ways and terminology well enough to really witness or to share with other people. That's not God's calling you to. Don't worry about what you don't know. Share what you do know as the Holy Spirit leads you. And then that God, God will open it up to other people. That's all Peter did. Peter didn't try to go, oh, i got to get all this theology and all this stuff in place. He just said, this is what happened. This is what happened. He starts with his, with his vision, goes to the people coming, and then goes to traveling, starts preaching. The Holy Spirit interrupts by pouring out his spirit upon him. He says, this is what happened. And that's, and that's all we need to do. He doesn't, and notice, he just tells, he doesn't try to embellish it. He doesn't go, well, let's make the story better and expand it, you know, because they may not believe it or understand it or may not be as exciting to them as it is to me. So we need, no, he just, this is what it is. State the facts. This is what happened. And then after he states the fact, after you state the facts, state your conclusion or your conclusions from it. Okay, Peter, Peter tells all this stuff. As you come to 15, verse 15. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Verse 17. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, 
Who was I to think that I could oppose God? Hey, I saw all these facts. Here was my conclusion. If God's doing the same thing in them that he's been doing in us, who am I to oppose God? Hey, if the Spirit of God is working and moving and touching people's hearts and touching people's lives, helping them grow, whether it's new people coming into the family or the, or the people who are already part of the family growing in their relationship with God, who am I to oppose it? Who am I to say that it's wrong? Who am I to say that it's ungodly? And we need to come to that. We need to, we need to come to that realization that, hey, if God is moving, we're, gonna, we're just going to say what he has done, what we thought of it. And trust God that he knows what he's going to do, what he's saying and what he's doing. Side sermon. And I think we need to come to the same conclusion that Peter came to. Right? If God is moving and God is at work and his spirit is leading and his spirit is moving, then who am I to oppose God? Right? That's how we become part of a bigger family. Because it's, it's not just about pay naz. You, you understand that, don't you? It's not just about us. We're part of a bigger family. We got, we got family all around this community that are meeting now as well. Some of them don't necessarily agree with everything they do, but guess what? The Spirit's working. The Spirit's moving. I'm for them. I'm not going to oppose God. Some of them, we don't have all the same doctrinal beliefs or the ways we look at things. Guess what? The Spirit's working in them. Spirit's working through them. And on the basics, we agree. Jesus Christ is the one and only live Savior. He's the Son of God. He's the only way to salvation. We agree with them on that. We agree that there's only one Spirit. It's the Spirit of God who lives inside of us, who leads us and empowers us. And, you know, we agree on those things. That's all we need to agree on. If they're not against us, they're for us, right? Yeah, we're on the same team. And, and we, need to, we need to come up with that and, and be willing to say, guess what? If God is moving, who am I to oppose God? And trust me, I've been around long enough, I've heard all the things. Oh, if that church is growing that fast, they must be watering down the gospel. Right? You ever heard that one? Oh, they're not, they're not truly preaching Jesus Christ. So they're not really calling people to repentance. They're just, they're, they've somehow watered it down and made it a lot easier. You know what I found? As I've talked to pastors from those churches and stuff, that the direct opposite is what is true. Usually they are much more strict than the rest of us are in what they're calling people to and what they're requiring. Okay? So we, we can't do that. But what, what I found, what I, self, self-confession, and I know it's just me. None of you would be like this, just everybody in every other church. Um, you know? is that oftentimes our excuses like that are not because we really want to discredit them for the sake of that doesn't, isn't how God works. It's that we want to try and excuse ourselves for why we're not part of it and why we're not seeing God move the way that he really wants to move in and through our lives. Like I said, I'm right there with you. Don't. Don't sit there and think I'm pointing the finger. I've been there too. All right? But when we come into this and say, you know what? Who am I to oppose God? If, if God is moving and God is working, then, then I'm for it. I'm for it. And they're a brother, they're a sister in Christ, and they're, and they're part of the kingdom of God, and we are on the same team. So how can I help build the kingdom? Number one, expect opposition. Number two, overcome the opposition. And then three, celebrate with the converts. Okay? When, as we share the truth of God, as, as we share the conclusions of God, the Holy Spirit is going to speak to their hearts, whether they're outside or inside. Okay? Whether they're already part of the family or, or, or whether they're, they're people we're trying to get back into the family. All right? 
that the Spirit of God is going to work. And as the Spirit of God works, there's, there's going to be a response. In this case, in verse 18, when they heard this, these are the people who were criticizing Peter. When the people who were criticizing people heard his report and his conclusion, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. They had a celebration. They celebrated the grace of God. They celebrated the work of God. They celebrated that that God is not limited. They celebrated that he is willing to receive everybody and anybody, and, and they got excited about it. And they experienced even greater unity. And, and, and here's the thing, is, is what we'll find and what I've found in my life and what I've seen in the world around and in the, in the kingdom of God and, and in things like this as you read through the Bible is that, is that as you share God's work and you share how God's moving and you share your conclusions about it, as the Holy Spirit moves, you will find who truly is on your team and who's truly his family. Those who really are part of the family of God, the Spirit's going to speak to them, and they're going to go, yeah, and they're going to get excited, and you're going to celebrate together, and you're going to find, yeah, we truly are on the same team. Those that don't buy in, those that don't listen to the Spirit and don't say, yeah, this is what the Spirit's doing and how the Spirit's working, we're excited about what the Spirit's doing, even if it's, if it's something different or whatever, they never were on your team. Now, now, let me make sure we get this right. As the Spirit is moving and the Spirit is speaking, this isn't on you. As the Spirit is moving and the Spirit is speaking, those who are in tune with the Spirit are going to get on board with what the Spirit is doing, right? Those that reject it were never on your team in the first place. But there's still hope. Keep speaking. The Spirit will keep working. Hopefully they'll listen, open up, and join the team. Whether, whether they never were on the team or they were and kind of decided to join, make their own team in the middle of it. Hopefully we'll get them back where the, where the, where the team is. But then we need to celebrate. Celebrate, celebrate, celebrate. That's what we're looking for, the work of the Spirit, the movement of the Spirit in our lives, through our lives, renewing our lives, sharing it with others that their lives may be renewed. And as the renewal continues to spread, both within the body and bringing people in, into the body and the body growing through it, that's when revival happens. That's when revival happens. It's interesting to me <laughs> that as you study revival, if you study revival... The interesting thing to me is, not one of the revivals was started by people praying for revival. Not one of them. But every one of them was started by people saying, God, help us grow closer to you and be more like Jesus. They were all focused on, God, renew me. Make me who you created me to be, that I may be who you created me to be. And in the midst of that renewal, God not only worked within them, he began to work through them. And revival became a byproduct as he continued to work in individuals. And so if we want to see change, if we want to see renewal in the people around us, if we want to see revival in our nation and in our world, even in our community, the first place we have to start is... God, renew me. I'm opening up myself to you. This isn't a new concept. (laughs) The psalmist said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my way. See if there is any wicked thing in me and lead me in the way that is everlasting. Right? This isn't new. It's renewing. It's remembering. And opening ourselves up once again to God's renewal. And as we allow God to do that, then then we can join him in building his kingdom. Then we can join him. And his plan and his purpose can continue to work in and through us. 
God, we thank you so much for being with us. We thank you for your love and your grace, your continued presence with us. We thank you, God, that you have called us to join you in building your kingdom and being part of your kingdom and in seeing your kingdom expand here on earth, both within us and through us. And so, God, we pray you'd help us to listen, to be obedient, to allow you to work in and through us as you desire. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. I'd like to invite the worship team to come back up as we continue to, to celebrate God's goodness, celebrate his work and his movement, the, the power of his spirit, the, the blood of Jesus that saves us and forgives us. And as we do, I, I invite you to stand, and we're going we're gonna to sing together. And as we sing, I want to invite you to, to, to take some time and just talk to God and say, God, where am I in all this? You want to renew, you want to, you want to renew me, you want to renew those around me, you want to, where, where am I in all this? Start with, God, have I allowed you to renew me, to give me a new life, to, to transform my life and help me to be who you created me to be? And, it, and, it, and it, as he goes, yes, then you go, woohoo, yes. How can, I be an object, how can I be an agent of renewal in the world around? How can I join you in your ministry and in your mission? And allow him to work with you. Is, is there anything that's hindering me from it? Any attitudes I have or my own conceptions or misconceptions of how it should look or whatever? God, would you show me what you desire? How you want me to work? How you want me to move? How I can join in? And, if he, and, and he may come to you and say, hey, you're already right where I want you to be. Celebrate that. Right? Get excited. Thank him for that, that he's brought you to that place. Recommit. Okay, but when you're, when you're, ready, when you're ready for more, <laughs> I'm here. I'm open. All right? Or if he comes to you and says, well, we got, we got some issues here. <laughs> we got some things that are hindering this. Don't get upset. Don't beat yourself up. Just say, okay, God, what do we need to do? I'll say yes. Whatever you want as you lead me, as you guide me, and I'll trust you with the details and with the outcomes. But I encourage you this morning to, if you want to come and pray, you're welcome to come and pray. If you want to pray right where you're at, let's take this time and spend some time with God, talking to Him, being honest with Him, allowing Him to be honest with us, and being obedient to what He calls us to. If you want to come to the altars, come as we sing.